as we cover the second and third seals today, I just want to make a recommendation once again. So that, friends, and each time we cover the seals, I'm going to make this recommendation. It is a recommendation, and it is only a recommendation, but it is nevertheless a strong recommendation. Is that all right? Okay, so the recommendation is as follows. In order for us to understand the book of Revelation, we must become students of the Bible itself. The only way that you can understand a book filled with signs and symbols is if you know how to compare Scripture with Scripture to unlock the very symbols in the book of Revelation and Daniel. Line upon line, precept upon precept, right? Here a little, there a little. So therefore, there are a few books that I recommend that each and every one of you you try to get hold of, maybe one by one, or as if, uh, if you have the resources to get all three books and to study these books. I tell you the truth, if you can study these books, you will stand in a powerful way at the end of time. I am saying that, friends, because at the end, friends, God will need men and women that can explain the scriptures. More and more as the world continues in the way that it's going, people will have questions. They will talk about the books of Revelation and Daniel, but they will not understand how to interpret the book. Or they may see something take place and they may just think, oh, that just fits this. Not realizing that there are systems in these books that have to be unlocked for us to understand it. For us to understand the, the, what it's talking about. So the first book is God Cares, The Message of Daniel. C. Mervyn Maxwell, the same author, is the writer of the second book. Or the author of the second book, God Cares, The Message of Revelation. And then thirdly, the third book I recommend each and every one of you get is a book by the name of Great Controversy. A few, uh, Actually, last week I went out with some friends handing out this book. Um, in D.C. at the very capital itself. And it was a powerful experience to see how people reacted towards whether they received it or they rejected it. And we had no hard feelings. You know, people are where they are in life, and there will come a point when they may see, okay, I have a need for something spiritual. And friends, believe you me, God is patient. It is true God is just. But friends, it would, be, it would surprise you how patient God is. And when times come, when it gets rough, you'll come right back in gently. And you will say, are you ready now to walk with me? And so friends, we actually, thank you, Sister Sharon, we actually have some out in the hallway. So if you want to pass some of those out or take one for yourself, you can grab a hold of it. Does this make sense? So why am I showing you this? Because God wants us to be what? knowledgeable of his word and how to understand the word and then communicate that word to others. So as we go into our subject today, I'm going to quiz you guys, but let's have a word of prayer as we commence. All right. Father in heaven, illuminate our minds and strengthen our hearts. My prayer, Lord, is that you would forgive me of my sins, of my shortcomings, and Father, use me as a conduit to communicate your word, your heart, that Lord, in all of these things that we learn today, that above all else, we may see Jesus. And that in seeing him, this, these things that we learn today may be transferred from just information to transformational. This is what we pray and we ask in Jesus Christ's name, let all of God's people say, amen. Amen. So you're with me in your Bibles in the book of Revelation chapter 6. And let us look at this. Now, I'm going to quiz you guys. Hopefully you have your notes from last time. But Revelation chapter 6 depicts a rider on a white horse. Does anyone remember what that rider had in his hand? A bow. Does anyone remember what the bow represented? 
The word of God. We saw that from Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 9. All right? We also saw that this rider is riding on what kind of horse? A white horse. The white in the Bible represents what? Purity or righteousness. We also saw that he's riding on a white horse. What does a horse in Bible prophecy represent? The church of God. All right? The text for that is found in Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 3. And if um, back there, Eric, I see you moving around. Thank you for doing all of this stuff. If it is possible, brother, if we can have some mics ready, because we're going to read some scriptures, only if possible. All right? So, as we look at this now, we found out that this first rider on this white horse, we're realizing that this white horse was a symbol of the New Testament church. Going forth with the bow of God's word, shooting the arrows of truth into the hearts of men and women in the first century. Winning souls, hence the depiction of this rider on the horse is one wearing a crown, going forth conquering and to conquer. Conquering territory for God. And that's what happened and you, do you remember when, when, when did the spark of the New Testament church take place? 31 AD, on the day of Pentecost, right? So on the day of Pentecost, you remember the disciples went out receiving the supernatural ability to speak in other languages. And how many were one in one day? 3,000 in one day. A few chapters later, 5,000. And it goes so on and so forth. Many souls being one. So this took place, we found out, from AD, as Sister Nicole mentioned, from AD 31 all the way to the end of the first century, AD 100. All right, so now we're realizing that these four horsemen of the apocalypse, as many call them, is actually a symbol of ages of the church starting from the days of the apostles, going all the way to the end of time. And so this is why it is vital not only for the Christian to understand the future, but it is imperative that we understand the past. Because it helps us to understand the future in a better way. So let's go to the second seal. And when you are there in your Bible, Revelation 6 verse 3. Just give me a shout out by saying amen. Amen. All right? So we're going to the second seal. And this horseman that we're going to notice here is red. All right? So he's a red, a person. He's riding a red horse. Let me say it that way. So it says in verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So now we're going to unlock what this actually means, all right? So I want you guys to look at this. Before we go into this, I want us to look at this subject, okay? So what color is the horse? The, ho- the color of the horse is red. Now, right off the bat, before you know anything else, what do we know a horse represents in Bible prophecy? Church. The church. Now, notice, as you switch from the first seal, the first horseman of the apocalypse, to the second horseman, what changes? The color of the horse. The color of the horse has gone from white to red. All right, so we're going to find out what this red means. But do I have a volunteer for Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 3? We're going to look at these texts again. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 3. Okay, so we got one. Okay, Sister Flo. And then do I have a volunteer for Isaiah chapter 1 and verse, that is not supposed to be verse 8, but 18. Who do I have for that? Elder Bobby. And then, do I have a volunteer 
for Romans 13, verses 1 through 4. Romans 13, verses 1 through 4. All right, Sister Ellen. All right, so when you are ready, Sister Flo is going to read Zechariah 10 and verse 3 for us. And I want you to notice what it calls God's people in this text. So we're looking at Zechariah 10, verse 3. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat, goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. Okay, so what is it called, the house of Judah, God's people? A goodly horse, all right? So we're seeing in, in figurative language, God compares his people to this kind of animal, to a horse. Now, in light of that now, we go to Isaiah 1, verse 18, and we have the mic coming to you, Elder Bobby. Praise the Lord. The Word of God reads in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thank you for reading that. So we're finding out that red in the Bible is a representation of sin. Though your sins be as scarlet. All right? So God is showing us here that in Scripture there is symbolic language that is used. And in the book of Revelation, all of the symbols of the Bible meets its end. So in order for you to understand Revelation, what are you going to have to know? The Bible, <laughs> right? You're going to have to know the Bible, right? You're going to have to know the stories of the Bible because it takes all of those stories and puts them into one book. And if you can remember the story, you can unlock the book. That is the good news of Scripture, all right? You can unlock the revelation, all right? So we're seeing here a horse represents church, I love how you guys said it. Not just God's people, it represents the church, right? Red or scarlet represents sin. So we're realizing here that it's not just about blood. We're seeing the reason for the change from white to red is because there is corruption that is beginning to enter. All right? The church, while, yes, they're experiencing bloodshed as we're going to see, the church is going from purity to sin itself, all right? Now we have Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. What does a sword represent in the Bible? So sometimes one symbol can represent multiple things. So we're going to see this here. In Romans 13, 1 to 4, let every soul be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. <clears throat> Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do, you, do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Thank you. So we're noticing here in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 4, the context is that it's speaking of the civil power. It's speaking of the government itself. Now, friends, according to this passage, Paul says it is the Christian's duty to live in harmony with what? With the government. And we understand that does that have limitations? Right. Whenever, what is the limitation? You tell me. Okay, so once the government, the way that you know the government oversteps its boundary is when it tells you to do something that is against the word of God. Apart from that, Paul says, live at peace in the governmental system that you're living under. Because what God wants us to do, friends, just as he did with Daniel, is he wants us to be a witness, even to those in high places, so that they can be one. 
But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when Nebuchadnezzar overstepped his limitations as a man, these three young Hebrew worthies said, we would rather die than disobey God. Right? So it's for us to understand that. Now, notice as Sister Ellen read, it says that the civil power and civil authorities do not hold the sword for no reason. God has given them this sword in order to execute judgment against those who are evildoers. So in other words, what the Bible is revealing to us is that the sword has two symbolic meanings in Scripture. It does not only refer to the Word of God, but the sword in Scripture refers to the civil power. It refers to the state. And God says in Revelation chapter 6, Friends, and this is why we know it can be the word of God that it's talking about here in Revelation 6 verse 4 concerning the second horseman of the apocalypse because it tells us with that sword, the second horseman had power to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And it says there was a great sword given him. So that's how we know this can be the word of God. For the word of God, does it cut to kill? No. No. The word of God cuts to heal. So therefore, we know the only other sword that this can be speaking of is the power of the state. So what it's revealing to us is that shortly after the days of the apostles, there would come a time where the church would seek to take into its possession the power of the state itself. And friends, that time actually is very interesting because that time will come again. It has not only happened in history, it will come again. And I always tell Christians this. I always tell my fellow Christian brethren this. The moment that a Christian has to use the power of the state in order to draw the citizens of its nation back to God is a moment when you know we are in a dangerous place. Because... You tell me, how does a Christian win someone to God? Okay, by his love. All right, all right. And we have something for that. What what do we call that? Jesus left it with us before he ascended. Yeah, left us the Holy Spirit. We got to do something with the Holy Spirit. We got to spread the word, right? We call that the Great Commission. In other words, it is not the power of the state that God wants to give us to win souls. It is the power of the Spirit that we need. It is by the Holy Spirit alone, friends. But whenever you see the church lacking in the power of the Spirit, many times it tries to compensate by laying hold of the power of the state. This, I tell you, this is why as we're studying this, we are studying the past, but we are also studying what is coming. Does that make sense? All right. Amen. Okay. So let's look at it. This is what one of my favorite writers, he actually said this. He actually lived back in the 1800s, but he points out this. Then this is your first blank that you're going to be filling out. Red equals sacrifice. So this is a powerful preacher during the Second Great Awakening. His name was William Miller. And Miller stated the second beast spoken of in this passage is represented, is the representation of the church, which is like a calf. And we'll see why he mentions this. Showing that the church would be given to the slaughter like a calf fatted for the market. During the period of the opening of this seal, which uh, which period lasted until, and here's your answer, Constantine put a period to the persecutions of the Christian church. So what happens here? Why why would he say this? We're going to see why he would actually say this. Because at the same time, this is why many scholars estimate by studying the seals, the churches, and the trumpets... They have come to the realization that the seven churches at the beginning of Revelation 
actually parallel the seven seals, which actually parallels the seven trumpets. So they are going, they're happening along the same time as each other. Does that make sense? Right? So if I were to say to you, does anyone know the first church in Revelation? The first church that is mentioned out of the seven churches. Ephesus. All right? So I want you to think with me, okay? If Ephesus is the first church, which seal would it be parallel to? The first. That's right. The second church is Smyrna. So which seal would it be parallel to? The second seal, which we are now covering, right? So therefore, if we look back at the second church, we should be able to find out what was happening during the second seal. Does that make sense? All right, fair enough. All right, so let's check it out. So go back with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, and we're going back to Revelation chapter 2. All right, Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to verse 8. So this is what was happening, and this is the reason why there was so much slaughter, as William Miller um, uh, actually mentioned. So Revelation chapter 2, verses 8, and we're going onward from there. And when you are there, please say amen. amen. All right, so it says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last. Now notice how Jesus identifies himself with this church which was dead and is alive. That gives you a hint as to what's going on. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but they're not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Why does he say this? Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Friends, this is powerful because when you look at the history of the church from 100 A.D. to 313 A.D., at the time when Constantine began to reign, you begin to realize that many Christians were martyred to their death. Friends, they took Christians, and maybe you saw, you've seen some, some of the pictures. They took Christians and they led them into coliseums, sent animals out into these coliseums, lions and other intense creatures, and they killed Christians in these coliseums. And it was all for sport. It was all a game to the very individuals looking on that were in leadership. And this happened with a lot of the emperors that reigned over Rome up until Constantine. Especially beginning with the emperor Nero. So as this happened now, Jesus says, many of you will suffer for your faith. You will die for your faith. But here's the good news. I am he who was once dead, but I am alive. Which means to tell us what? Even if you die, you will live again. Amen? Amen? Friends, this is the good news. We have a Savior. Friends, if there is anything that separates us from the rest of the world, Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then our faith is in vain. But because Christ died and rose again, we have the promise that even if we die for him in this world, we will live again. And so these people died knowing that we are dying for our Lord and he will raise us at the last day. All right. So all that I've said so far, does this make sense? All right. Praise the Lord. So let's go on to point two. We realize that, yes, the red represents sacrifice, but the red also represents corruption. All right, as we read, I believe it was Elder Bobby who read that for us. It says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, 
they shall be white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, Paul, prophesying about this time period, says in the book of Acts, it's interesting, Paul was truly not just an apostle, Paul was a prophet. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 20, verses 29. Acts chapter 20 and verse 29, Paul says the following. Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. It states here, and that was the answer for your second crucial point. It was, though your sins be like scarlet. But now we're going to read this here concerning the corruption. He says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Now, notice what Paul says. He, he says, after my departing, what is he referencing? His death. So he knew that after the, the period of the white horse, corruption was coming. There are people that will rise in the church while the church is being persecuted from without that would actually rise up within the church to be a deceptive vehicle to deceive the very people that are trying to, following, to, trying to follow Christ. All right? So Paul prophesies this, and in light of this now, we're going to look at this next statement. So this is what was written by Taylor G. Bunch. He is a powerful author, wrote a book by the name of The Revelation on page 36, interpreting the very things that we're talking about. And this is what he states here. He says, The weapon of the previous horseman was a bow, which represented the sword of the Spirit. These are the mighty weapons of warfare described in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5. The purpose of this mighty sword is to save and not destroy. But the great sword given to the rider of the red horse was to be used to take peace from the earth and to kill one another. It is evident that this is not the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, but the sword of the state. All right? So your answer there is the purpose of the mighty sword is to? Save. All right, save and not destroy. All right, so that is the answer to that last part. And this is taken from Taylor G. Bunch, The Revelation, on page 36. Now, friends, a little aspect of history here that we'll look at is that the Bible tells us that Christ said, some of you will experience this persecution and be cast into prison for 10 days. Now, does anyone remember in Bible prophecy, what does a day, we've gone through this before, represent in prophecy? A year, right? The text for that is Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34. So a day in Bible prophecy represents a year. So Jesus is literally telling them, some of you at a certain point during this period, between 100 AD and 313 AD, you all will be cast into prison for 10 years. And friends, it's very interesting. The persecution rose to its highest toward the last 10 years before Constantine. This is what history reveals. So from 303 AD to 313 AD, for the space of 10 years, Christians were so persecuted that when Constantine finally came into power, Fox's Book of Martyrs actually tells us that there were people, once they heard the decree that now Christianity is a legal religion, it says people came forth from the forests. They came forth from different places in the wilderness, and as they came forth, some of them, their eyes were missing. Some of them had no hands because it was stripped from them in persecution. Some of them, they were actually crawling on the floor because they had no legs. 
That's how intense the persecution was. We think we're being persecuted. When certain things happen to us, friends, I tell you the truth. We do not yet know what persecution really looks like. There are people in other lands today that are losing their lives for standing up for the Christian faith. May we thank God that, friends, we have what we have. Because when that time comes, my prayer for us and my prayer for myself is that I will be faithful if that time should come in our lifetime. And I truly believe that it will. All right? So you have the time span there of the second seal. And what is the time span? You guys tell me. 100 to 313 AD. All right? So let's go now into the third seal. And we're doing good on time. All right? So let's go into the third seal here. The third seal, we find a similar situation. So we're going back to Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to the next seal. So let's look at the rider on the black horse. All right, so Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to verse 5. And when you're there, say amen. All right? So it states... And when he had opened the third seal, and, and keep in mind, who's opening these seals? Jesus Christ, right? So he's standing in heaven, and he is opening the seals on this scroll. And with each seal he opens, there's a period of history that is being unlocked. So he says here in verse 5, And when he had opened this, the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, what color? A black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. This is the third horseman of the apocalypse. All right? So notice... Do we still have a horse? What has changed? The color. It's gone from white to red to black. All right? So as we look at this, what should that tell us then? It got worse. That's a nice way of putting it. Right? It got worse. All right? So it's worse than even the red horse. All right, it's worse than the red horse, and it's definitely worse than the white horse. All right, so more corruption has entered in. So let's begin breaking this down. So we know according to Zechariah 10 verse 3, it is speaking about the church. All right, and there's still a union here. There's going to come a separation in light of this corruption. But right now, there's still a union. And this is the beautiful difference between the seven churches and the seven, and the seven seals, especially the first four. The seven churches deals with God's people who are seeking to stand true to him, but they have problems all the way up to the end. The seven seals, however, deals with the slow apostasy that happens, that results in the separation of God's people from those who love the world, but yet try to still lay hold of Christ. That's what the seals are laying out for us. So, as you're there with me, we need some volunteers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, who do we have for that? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. All right, Sister Flo, thank you. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Who do we have for that one? Uh, 12. Elder Bobby, you got me on that one? Okay. And then Amos chapter 8 verses 4 through 6. Who do we have for that one? All right. Sister Nicole, thank you. All right. Amos chapter 8, eight verses 4 through 6. Okay. So we'll start off now. We're looking at what darkness represents, the color what the color represents in Scripture. And we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14.
Do not unequally do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Okay. So notice God says, do not have fellowship with darkness. So the idea is that this is darkness in a, in a sense symbolizes corruption. It symbolizes to go downward instead of upward. All right? As in the color. All right? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Elder Bobby, and we have a mic coming to you. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, the word of God reads, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hey, so notice that when we're looking at this darkness, as Elder Bobby just read, who does Paul say is the one who's really behind this? The enemy of souls. So whenever there's corruption entering into the midst of God's people, you can be sure that Satan is at work. And the goal of God's people is to return to Christ because he is the only solution, friends. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting. You remember that rider on the white horse, right? The riders, now I'll ask you, I'll ask you guys. How is a horse led if a person wants it to go in a specific place. What's, what's one of the best ways? Bridle, right? Okay. And you have situations where, of course, as we know, many people, they take the time to ride horses. That's something I, I haven't done in years that I would love to do again. Right? Last time I, I did that, I almost got my leg crushed. But by God's grace, I still want to do it again. Right? So... As that rider rides the horse, he's actually leading it, all right? Now, once he leads the horse, I want to ask you this. If the rider leads the horse, then what do you think the rider is a symbol of? The horse is the church. What do you think the rider has to therefore be a symbol of? Okay, so first and foremost, it has to be the Spirit of God. Devoid of the Spirit, the church will go in the wrong direction. Regardless of what we're going to look at next, if you don't have the Spirit of God, it is automatic that we will go in the wrong direction. Now, as the Spirit works, how, how does He work to guide the church? Through the Word, for sure. People for sure, but it's a specific kind of people. Prophets, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, leaders, right? But you have to have the spirit. So spirit-led leaders is what is being represented in these writers, okay? But of course, and this goes back to what you mentioned Brother Matt, that was so powerful what you said, because in Revelation chapter 19, it's interesting. We have Jesus as a rider on a white horse. So ultimately, it's Christ who is the leader by the Spirit's power leading the church, right? But Christ is now saying, okay, I'll work through the leadership, and as long as they stay connected to me, you can be sure you'll go in the right place. But if they disconnect, you can be sure that church will become red and then it will become black. All right? So the darker the color, the greater the corruption. All right? So the rider on the horses represents the leadership of the horses at that time. Does that make sense? From the red horse onward, representing leadership that's not led. By the Spirit of God. Okay? So, we continue. All right? So, Amos chapter 8, verse, verses 4 through 6. Sister Nicole. So, now we're looking at the balances. What does this represent? 
Amos chapter 8, verse 4 through 6 says, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. Wow. So notice, the Bible tells us, thank you for reading that, Sister Nicole, in order to take advantage of the poor, these people, they had to, and lo notice that phrase, they had to falsify the balances. All right? So it gives us an indication that while these men may have been whatever they were in the church, at that time, they were also judges at that time. Does that make sense? So that means as we look at this writer here, we're looking at leadership in the church, but we're realizing that the church, what's the color again? Black, which means corruption, which means the balances are corrupt. In other words, these men, they may be in leadership positions in the church, but at the same time, they are judges. And not only are they judges, but they are judging the people, not in righteousness, but according to the way of the enemy. Now, we're going to notice this. This is one of the things that I wanted to bring out here. Same book evidence, it mentions, and this is one of the other answers for you, the measure of wheat and barley for a penny. Now, this is powerful. We see that he not only has a pair of balances, but he all, it also says in verse 6, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, and see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. The measure of wheat and barley for a penny denote that the members of the church would be eagerly engaged in worldly goods. And that's why, as you read, Sister Nicole, you remember, the reason that they falsified the balances in Amos was for the love of money, right? <laughs> so once you know that story, you know, oh, okay, this is why these leaders are doing that. They have come to the point where they love money more than they love God's word and the people that they are called to serve. So it says here, they would be eagerly engaged after worldly goods and the love of money would be the prevailing spirit of the times. For they would dispose of anything for money. Continuing, this is now by Harold E. Metcalf, the great prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. The use of the terms a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny is an appropriate representation of the spirit of commercialism which entered the church. Just about everything in connection with the church had its price and was sold. For instance, and now it should give you a hint. I'm not going to say who it is, but it should give you a hint as to which church we're addressing. For instance, at birth, baptism, confirmation, confession, marriage, death, and even after death, to get a person out of purgatory, the priest was paid. All right? I'm not saying who it is yet. All right? But do you guys know who it is? Amen. All right? Okay? And I respectfully say that those of you who know it is, who it is, does God have his faithful people there too? Yes. All right? But we're talking about a system here. That's what we're addressing. So in this system, there would be massive corruption. And friends, that's what you see when you look at history. The reason that this system was formed is because men, as a result of gaining civil power, they chose Constantine in his time when he made Christianity legal. We are told that actually Constantine had a vision, which I don't believe actually happened. But we are told he had a vision and in the vision, he looked up at the sky, and he saw in the sky the symbol of the cross. And as he saw that symbol, he felt that it was the call to him to become Christian. 
And so what he did was he had all of his soldiers walk through a specific river to the other side. And once they got to the other side, he said they were baptized. And so what happened was he said, I realized that the Roman Empire is crumbling. And I need to connect this empire to some kind of powerful trend that is happening in my time. If I can connect it to something that's powerful enough, maybe the empire may not, be, may not continue to fracture. And so the trend that he saw in his day, that was a trend that had been existing since the first century, was the trend of the explosion of the Christian church. That the church, even though it had gone on for hundreds of years, it was still continuing to grow, despite the fact that so many were being killed. For every one that was killed, 20 others popped up. He said, I need to connect. And so, with the power that he had, the civil power, he made a deal with the religious leaders that existed at that time. And said, I will give you power if you are willing to unite with me. And as a result of that union, friends, a church of compromise was born. But friends, the good news is God tells us this in Revelation chapter 6 and verse at the end of verse 6. He says, and see, you heard not the oil and the wine. Friends, this is good news, right? Because... Here's what we're going to look at here. What does the oil and wine represent? What does the oil and wine represent? Oil in Scripture represents the Spirit of God. When David was anointed by Samuel, it says as he was anointed, the Spirit of God actually came upon him. So oil in Scripture represents the Holy Ghost, and wine in the Scriptures represents the truth of God's word. That means unfermented wine represents the truth of God's word. And so as we read this here, keep that in mind. This is written by Austin Cook, Understanding the Revelation, number 9, page 19. In the period of the black horse, did the Holy Spirit and true doctrine disappear? So in the midst of all of this compromise, did God lose his truth? God forbid, right? Was, right, was the righteousness of Christ still available? God decreed, hurt not the oil and the wine. In other words, let them not disappear. Let them be preserved. When the apostate church began to dominate the world, God preserved small remnants of people who had in their possession the precious word of God in its purity. And what was one of these groups among many others? The Waldenses of northern Italy were one such group. They possessed the word of God in their native tongue. And friends, you know what's interesting about the Waldenses as you look at history? What's very interesting is do you know one of the major, unique, identifying marks of the Waldenses? They were Sabbath keepers, right? They kept the seven-day Sabbath preserved even though decades and centuries had gone by, they were, but you know where they kept it though. This is why I recommended to you guys the book, Great Controversy. Friends, history tells us that they kept it in hiding. Because if they went out and started doing it openly, they would have been killed for their faith. Friends, we are actually told, and this is the kind of spirit I pray to have. Because what we're told is that the Waldenses would train their children and they would, they would actually take the Bible and make copies of it, writing it, writing it. This is before the printing press, writing it. And not only that, they would take pieces of it and they would make coats where you can put that word into that coat. Why? Because they would train their children that there's coming a time when you will have to make a living. And the way you will make it, you will make it in a way that you can win souls. But where are the souls? The souls are in the very places where they can get killed. <laughs> so they made them the coat. They put the scriptures in the coat. And they trained them in different trades. That they can go into the marketplace and sell food. 
that they can become vendors of different products. And as they were out there and they were selling their products, they may have heard of someone who was in distress. And they would speak a word of hope to them. And that person would say, where did you get that? How, did you, how do you know that? And as they saw, as they, they looked and they were very careful, they said, okay, this person's open. Let me show you where. They took out the scriptures and read it to them. That began, a, that was the beginnings, friends, of what would ultimately become the Protestant Reformation. Even before John Wycliffe, you had groups like this, that God through which God preserved the wine and the oil. Friends, does this make sense? All right? So as we close, we're realizing the, this third seal goes from 313, and now we're going to see next time to 538. And what we're trying to do, as you can probably tell today, is cover two seals per presentation so that we can have an understanding of it, preparing us for the sixth seal. Because, friends, we're living in the sixth seal. And so I pray today, my prayer for us today is that, as I've been saying through the message, may we have that kind of allegiance to God. May we know that God has sent his son into the world to give his life for us. Not that necessarily we may go free. Because friends, we still have to face trials in this world. The world is not a bed of roses. It is filled with trials and temptations. But as I mentioned to you, I know one who was dead. And he is alive again. Amen? With that, let's have a word of prayer as we close. Father, thank you for the history of your word. I remember there was once a time, Father, where I hated history. I did not like to study it at all. I hated history class. And in many times, Lord, sadly, I gave my teachers problems in those classes. But Father, I thank you for bringing me to your word. And as a result, changing my heart that I can have a greater love for history and to see the practical lessons that you would have me to learn. As we've looked at these seals today, the second and third seals, I pray that as we continue studying them, that they may make more and more sense. And Father, I pray that you may give us the spirit and the fervor that these people had. A fervor that tells us we must go and reach others even at the cost of our lives. Help us to know that you die that the gospel may go to the world. Help us not to be comfortable where we are, but to know, Lord, that you have, that, Lord, we were born, we are alive at this moment for a purpose, and that is to fulfill the Great Commission. Help us to do this as was mentioned, by your Holy Spirit. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.